She sells seashells by the seashore. She sells seashells by the seashore. She sells seashells by the seashore. Yes, I've been practicing that for days and I got it right. <sighs> Have you ever considered that verse might be about a real person? It may be about a real woman who became known as the princess of paleontology. Mary Anning was a self-taught working class woman geologist who uncovered some of the most significant fossil finds of the 19th century. Her landmark discoveries changed the day's dominant religious views that the world and all of its creatures were created in seven days. These fossils eventually factored into Darwin's theory of evolution. She worked alongside some of the biggest names in 19th century science, now, now. However, she was rarely credited for her work at the time. Yeah. Unlike these men, unlike these men, Mary came from nothing. She was born in 1799 in Lyme Regis, a tiny little town off the southern coast of England. Its main industry was smuggling cargo off of ships. Her family was desperately poor. They were so poor that the only house they could afford up on those cliffs flooded with the ocean every time it stormed. Mary's father died when she was 11, and soon she started searching on the beach for curios she could sell to support her family. Soon, fossil hunting on those dangerous cliffs, dodging falling rocks and riptides, became her passion. Lyme Regis and Mary's fortunes were changing, though, as the beach became a spa destination. Wealthy travelers loved souvenirs, and soon Mary's curio business picked up. One day when she was 12, Mary and her brother Joseph found something unusual. It was a four foot long, toothy skull. It had giant eyes and room for 200 teeth like a crocodile. Mary later unearthed the full skeleton. It looked like a cross between a crocodile, a dolphin, and a swordfish. It was her first major find, which was eventually named the ichthyosaur. Though of course she didn't receive formal credit for it, the ichthyosaur ended up in the London Museum and put Mary on the map. So many of these so-called gentlemen geologists soon came to Lyme Regis to seek fossils and her help, and some even became her friends. Now, Mary was exceptional. She taught herself anatomy, animal morphology, geology, fossil preparation, and scientific illustration. She did art, too. She could spot, patiently excavate, and carefully transport the most delicate of fossils, and she always preserved them in excellent condition. If this sounds easy, it's not. It's separating rock from slightly different rock. And she was collaborative, too. She learned from her new gentleman friends, and she also worked with the Philpot sisters. They were some neighbors of hers in Lyme Regis who also collected fossils. Hours spent in the field made Mary's insights more valuable than many of the day's armchair theorists, those gentlemen geologists. Then in 1823, she found something really different. She'd found several more ichthyosaurs and other fossils, but this specimen was something special. It was 10 meters long from head to tail with an enormous neck and flippers for feet. Parts resembled fragments found by other geologists. Only Mary's specimen was complete and, of course, well-preserved. But what was it? News of her finds soon reached Georges Cuvier, the famous French naturalist, one of the greatest intellectual minds in Europe at the time. He could describe whole animals from a single bone, and he was always Right. <laughs> he first proposed the concept of extinction and almost single-handedly founded comparative anatomy. This fancy French guy was big time. Now, Cuvier was extremely skeptical of Mary's drawings. How could a creature with such a long neck even breathe? He said, probably in French. <laughs> it couldn't possibly be real. He was also inherently suspicious of these English curio collectors who fooled naturalists with Franken-skeletons made up of more than one animal or plaster pieces to fill in holes and command a higher price. He pointed to a crack in the skeleton as evidence of the fabrication. It was merely a mashup of a turtle and a snake, he said. 
<sighs> now, Cuvier had so much clout, he didn't have to prove anything to cast doubt over Mary's find. He could ruin her. No one would trust the authenticity of her fossils, let alone buy from her ever again. Now, Mary had done all the work. She had risked her life on the crumbling cliffs. She found the skeleton. She carefully excavated it, transported it, cleaned, and illustrated it. But all of that, all of that was the easy part. The hard part? Convincing the founding father of paleontology that her find was real. Luckily for Mary, she had some gentleman geologists on her side. You see, they're good for something. <laughs> they convened a special meeting at the Geological Society. Her friends, using her drawings, demonstrated that her fossil's features matched those of the earlier incomplete finds. They were able to prove that Mary's mystery fossil was authentic. Cuvier, after studying Mary's drawings and the bones themselves, even admitted he was wrong. I know. The find was the first ever complete specimen of the newly named plesiosaur. How pleasing. But it was certainly not the last to be spotted. <laughs> Mary, her friends, and her fossil showed that Cuvier was fallible. A shame she wasn't at the meeting to do so in person. As a woman, she hadn't been invited. Her friend William Coneybear, who presented the paper, took credit for the find. And when asked, he referred to Mary as a proprietor to suggest that money was the only motive for her interest in fossils. <sighs> but undeterred, Mary went on to make more significant finds. The dimorphodon, a type of pterosaur, the squalaraja, a fish, and the study of bezoar stones, now known as coprolites. Yes, fossilized dinosaur poop. Now, I'll leave the poop up for a minute to talk about Louis Agassi, noted scientific racist and Darwin's great antagonist. Because he actually thanked Mary in a book and named some fish after her. Most of her finds were usually named after the men who bought them from her. Mary visited London and grew her network. Finally, she was on the up and up. She bought a house in Lyme Regis and opened a real shop, selling those seashells by the seashore and possibly inspiring the famous verse. After decades of work, Mary had finally gained some respect from the geologic community, though as a woman, she was still not considered a pure scientist. She once wrote, the world has used me so unkindly, I fear it makes me suspicious of all mankind. <laughs> Oh, uh, in this case, all. Because gentlemen geologists still took advantage of Mary by inviting her on fossil walks without paying her for her time or crediting her in their papers. They also mocked her for being an older single woman who didn't feel the need to look particularly feminine. Richard Owen, famous grump and plagiarist, <laughs> once wrote to a friend that he was going to take a rundown to make love to Mary Anning at Lyme. A sarcastic line meaning he was going to chatter up in hopes of free fossils. Others still didn't understand how hard she worked. George Carus, personal doctor of Frederick of Saxony, visited Mary's shop and later wrote about Lyme Regis weather. He wrote, heavy winter rains loosen the coast so that the rarest fossils are made accessible, almost without labor. Keep in mind a falling rock had killed her dog while she was working a few years before. There is no record of what Mary said to Carus, but when he asked her to write down her name in his address book, she wrote beside it, I am well known throughout the whole of Europe. <laughs> Pretty badass. But then Mary found a lump in her breast. Two years later, she died of breast cancer at the age of 47. Members of the Geological Society that she had not been permitted to join paid tribute with an obituary in their journal, a eulogy and a stained glass window at Mary's local church. The dedication reads, in commemoration of her usefulness in furthering the science of geology, her benevolence of heart and her integrity of life. She was useful, like a tool. She would not live to see Darwin publish on the origin of species in 1859, citing fossils in his famous theory of evolution. 
She would not live to see the Geological Society finally admit women as peers in 1904. And she would not live to see a wing in the London Museum of Natural History, founded by Richard Owen, named after her in 2018. The recognition of Mary Anning's work as science has come only in the past few decades, only in the past few decades. In addition to the museum wing, there are many books about her and a feature film currently in production starring Kate Winslet. <laughs> Mary has assumed her rightful position as a pioneer of science. <laughs> By continuing to tell Mary's story, we fill in a gap in the historical record, just as she filled in ones in the fossil record. I believe we have missed out on so much over the centuries by not recognizing the contributions of women and others outside the dominant paradigm. Those who were not the great men. And so I would like to raise a glass to Mary Anning and others like her, not only to the work that they have done, but to the work that I know they were capable of doing had they been given the credit and the opportunities that they deserved. Thank you.